All those tiny little stitches. How does anyone ever find the time to make a quilt? It would take me forever. It does take time to make a quilt. Yet, a hundred years ago, nearly every woman in America made quilts. Why did they do it? Why do some still do it? The answer is complex. There are practical, personal, and social reasons for making quilts. In the days before central heating, women made quilts to keep their families warm. Every household needed large numbers of warm bed covers. Few could afford to buy blankets. Not everyone had the equipment or knowledge to weave. Waste not, want not. To prepare for quilt making, women saved the scraps of fabric left for making clothing for the family. From scrap bag remnants, they selected pieces for their quilts. Responding to the human desire to create beauty, quilt makers arranged colors and patterns in aesthetically pleasing combinations. But there's another whole set of factors that influenced the way women made quilts. They sometimes combined the work of quilt making with opportunities for social interaction. Social factors played a vital role in American life in the 19th century. Some of the same social factors continue to affect our lives today. Hands all around. This quilt pattern from the Middle West symbolizes the spirit of rural America. Knowing that many hands make light work, neighbors gather to help each other with heavy or tedious work. House raisings, log rollings, corn shuckings, and quiltings, all these were easier when neighbors came to lend a helping hand. When me and my husband was first married, he was clearing the big new grounds, and, and they, he, we invited all everybody to come in to help him and roll the logs off of the new ground, and the women folks come and qu helped me, and we quilted and cooked a big dinner then for them when they got through. That's the way people used to do, and help each other. At the end of the day, when work was finished, the spirit of sharing erupted into a big supper and square dance. Now join in and circle out. Here we go now. Patchwork quilt. We usually think of the two words together. Actually, each word refers to a different process. There are patchwork pieces that are not quilted, and there are quilts that are not made of patchwork. Patchwork means making a large piece of cloth from smaller ones. There are two principal techniques for making patchwork. If you sew the small pieces together directly, this is called piecing. Geometric patterns are usually pieced. If you sew small pieces onto larger ones, this is called applique. Most quilt patterns with flowers or lots of curves are appliqued. Quilting is a process by which two or three layers of fabric are sewn together. This is usually done by hand using a series of tiny stitches called running stitches. To make running stitches, the quilter pushes the needle up and down through all the layers before she pulls the needle through. Quilting evolved when people discovered that two or three thin layers of fabric were warmer than a single heavy layer. A quilted garment provides multiple layers. It is light and weight. Modern sleeping bags and quilted jackets work on the same principle. They use layers to create air pockets. They furnish warmth without weight. Originally, quilting developed because of its practical qualities. Almost immediately, the aesthetic values were added to the practical. Artistic women have always made the most of the decorative possibilities of quilting lines. In Europe, quilting decorated not only bed covers, but all sorts of fancy clothing, sometimes in combination with beadwork, embroidery, and other fine handwork. Historically, needlework falls within the sphere of a woman's responsibility. In every culture, women who excelled in needle arts were held in high regard. Europeans who settled in America brought needlework skills with them. In the early years in the colonies, decoration was often sacrificed to necessity. Winters were cold and materials of all kinds were scarce and expensive. Women made quilts from whatever they had. They recycled the still good parts of worn out clothing and saved even the smallest remnants. These early quilts were warm and practical. Many were attractive. 
American quilt makers develop simplified styles of quilting. The European preference for elaborate decoration gradually gave way to practical, straightforward, overall quilting lines. Fan quilting became popular in the late 19th century and is still a favorite technique. A whole new American style of quilt making evolved during the early years of this country. Its characteristics included the use of repeated blocks of geometric patterns, uncomplicated quilting designs, and a distinctly American phenomenon, the quilting bee. The bee, the busy social insect, became the symbol of frontier cooperation. During the first half of the 19th century, there were bees and helping get-togethers of all types. The concept of leisure for American working people is a recent one. Only when American city dwellers began to take jobs in factories and offices did the idea of the nine to five job develop. In rural areas, the separation between work and relaxation was less distinct. Activities that brought people together for work also provided opportunities for them to socialize. In some places, they were called frolics. More than a century ago, Dr. J. G. M. Ramsey described the spirit of frontier cooperation in Tennessee. He wrote, A failure to ask a neighbor to a raising, a clearing, a chopping frolic, or his family to a quilting was considered a high indignity and was required to be explained or atoned for at the next muster or county court. Each settler was not only willing but desirous to contribute his share to the general welfare and public improvement and felt aggrieved and insulted if the opportunity to do so was withheld. A woman planning a quilting bee would pick a day and invite her friends and neighbors. Before her guests arrived, she would have her unquilted top, the cotton filling, and plain backing fabric fastened together in the quilt frames, all ready to begin. The advantage of the bee is obvious. To a woman working alone, the vast expanse of a large quilt top can seem overwhelming. A number of women working together could finish a top in a fraction of the time and have a good time doing it. Beginning early in the day and working in shifts, the women stitched methodically and exchanged news, gossip, and recipes. For some, the quilting bee might be the only opportunity to visit exclusively with other women. Ruth Finley, writing in 1929, described the way the quilting bee developed in some areas. Starting from the grimness of economic need, the quilt became a social factor. Soon no function was more important than the quilting bee. For many years, it was the most popular form of feminine hospitality. As good quilting was then quite as much a social requisite as good bridge playing is today, it behooved a woman to be expert with her needle. By supper time, the quilt would be finished and the frame taken down. The hostess and her guests provided platters of chicken, ham, vegetables, and pies and cakes of many kinds. Husbands and families arrived from their work to share in the feast. Supper was followed by games and dancing, providing the real focus for social activity. Entire families enjoyed these parties, and young people of courting age especially. A lot of times the young people would have a little party after the They'd play games and have a good time. Also, at the corn shucking, if the corn shucking didn't last too long and took too long to shuck the corn, they always had a social gathering afterwards and played and games and had a good time, especially the young folk. After the party, young men escorted the young ladies to their homes. <laughs> and quilting have always served a number of functions in traditional American life. Many of these involved courtship and marriage. The dower chest of the old-time bride was supposed to contain at least a baker's dozen of quilts. 
Twelve of these were fashioned with a view to everyday use. The thirteenth was a bride's quilt, a piece elaborate in both pattern and quilting. And, of course, the bride's quilt has a long history. The last quilt that a girl made was her bride's quilt, and people came in and helped her quilt it. And uh, they quilted uh, hearts in a bride's quilt, but it was bad luck to do hearts in anything else. The announcement of a girl's engagement was frequently made at a quilting bee, at which time the tops were quilted. Although tops had been pieced and saved in many instances for years, they were not quilted until a girl was ready to marry, as the real expense came when the wadding and back had to be supplied. So to invite guests to the quilting of a girl's top, was the equivalent of announcing her approaching marriage. These quilting parties developed into the bridal shower. A girl wrote in her diary of a quilting bee that took place during the Civil War. March 26, 1862. I have been up at Laura Chapin's from 10 o'clock in the morning until 10 at night, finishing Jeannie Howell's bed quilt, as she is to be married soon. Almost all of the girls were there. We finished it at 8 p.m., and when we took it off the frames, we gave three cheers. In some places, it was a custom to place a cat in the center of a new quilt. The unmarried girls and boys held the edges of the quilt and tossed the cat into the air. The person closest to the spot where the cat landed will be the next to be married. Groups of people have used quilts to commemorate events or to show appreciation to others. Quilts made this way became historical documents or symbols of human interaction. Many a departing minister received an album quilt from his congregation. The quilt was carefully embroidered with the names of all the members. It is hard to overestimate the community influence of the quilt. It was the one grand excuse for the gathering of home-tied women. Public as well as private bees were in high favor, and many a church floor has been carpeted as a result of the quilting proficiency of the ladies' aid. In our church, uh, well, even before I was married, uh, the ladies would uh, quilt make quilts for the church, you know, to sell, to raise money. And uh, right after I was married, they did it just, uh, well, probably about every week. They'd meet in someone's home and, and work on a quilt. And when they got it done, they'd sell it and give the money to the church. Over the frames, gossip, news, and opinions were exchanged. It is said that the first suffrage speech ever listened to in Cleveland was delivered by Susan B. Anthony at a church quilting. Susan B. Anthony was not the only political figure to make use of the quilting bee. Tennessee's fiddling governor Bob Taylor toured the lecture circuit in the late 1890s. His down-home humor and style delighted audiences all over the state. In his most famous lecture, The Fiddle and the Bow, he describes a quilting scene. It was an old-time quilting the May Day of the glorious ginger cake and cider era of the American Republic, and the needle was mightier than the sword. The pen of Jefferson announced to the world the birth of the child of the ages. The sword of Washington defended it in its cradle, but it would have perished there had it not been for the brave women of that day who plied the needle and made the quilts that warmed it, and who nursed it and rocked it through the perils of its infancy into the strength of a giant. The quilt was attached to a quadrangular frame suspended from the ceiling. 
and the good women sat around it and quilted the live long day and were courted by the swains between stitches. At sunset, the quilt was always finished. Then followed the groaning supper table, surrounded by giggling girls, bashful young men, and gossipy old matrons who monopolized the dis conversation. There was a warm and animated discussion among the old ladies as to what was the most delightful product of the garden. One old lady said that, so far as she was concerned, she preferred the paternip. Another one preferred the pertator, and still another one the cowcumber. But suddenly a wise-looking old dame raised her spectacles and settled the whole question by observing, Ah, ladies, you may talk about your turnips and your taters and other gyard and sass, but the sweetest vegetable that ever melted on these old gums of mine is the possum. Not all quilting was done at the quilting bees. Many women chose or were forced by isolation to quilt alone. The quilting frame was used so often that it was almost considered part of the household furnishings. In some houses, the frame was hung from the ceiling so that it could be raised up, quilt and all, out of the way when no quilting was going on. The invention and mass marketing of the sewing machine in the 1850s revolutionized home sewing and set the stage for mass-produced, ready-to-wear clothing. Women could now piece quilts by machine if they chose. Occasionally, one finds a cover that is machine quilted also, but most women continue to quilt by hand. Great economic and social changes took place around the turn of the century that caused a decline in quilt making. Inex inexpensive machine-made blankets became available, and many women, free from household chores, took jobs. But this decline was only temporary. Interest in quilt making runs in cycles, and revivals seem to coincide with periods of economic recession. It is no accident that during the Great Depression of the 1930s, women took up quilting. A letter written by a Minnesota farm woman in 1931 describes the hard times. I have been real busy this summer, for farmers aren't hiring any help, only what was really necessary, for it was so hot and dry around here during July and August that crops are a failure. I've done quite a lot of canning of what is left of our fruit and vegetables. And for the winter, I think I shall make a quilt to keep from getting lonesome, for some of the women around here are real interested in quilting again. In the last 10 or 15 years, many thousands of women and men have rediscovered quilt making. A number of factors contribute to this renewed interest. The bicentennial celebration encouraged Americans to explore national, local, and family history. Some found quilts to be a personal link with the past. In this age of mass-produced consumer goods, we have come to value handcrafted items of all kinds, including quilts and other needlework. In the ecological awareness of the 1970s, we all discovered something that quilt makers have known all along. Materials can be recycled, economically and beautifully. The quilting bee, which never completely disappeared, is alive and well among church groups, home demonstration clubs, and senior adult centers. These groups generally make quilts, not for their own use, but to raise money for community projects. Though the basic purpose is to lay away money for worthy projects, rather than to lay away quilts for winter warmth, the result is the same. These women come together to perform a useful activity and, at the same time, to enjoy the social interaction it provides. We are rediscovering some of the values of an earlier way of life, values which may help us during the coming years. And they rotated around. That's the reason people loved each other, so they worked together. They, li they helped each other, they lived for each other. And it wasn't just for sale. They, uh, they was, uh, I think that they, the people them days had more, more love in their hearts for each other than they do have today.